Uh, welcome, friends, to today's session on uh, risk journalism. And this is a very uh, new kind of a concept. It is basically uh, derived from a concept of risk society. So I thought it would be an appropriate time to talk about uh, risk society and risk journalism. So in the next few slides, I'll uh, try and uh, introduce the concept of uh, risk society, which may be new for students, but it's uh, uh, not a new concept per se. And also the concept of uh, risk journalism and uncertainty. So uh, let me just share my screen and we'll start the. Uh... Just a moment, just give me a moment. So can someone confirm whether you can see the screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's visible. Thank, thank you so much. So before I start with risk journalism, let's try and first of all find out something about, uh, or let's uh, find out the uh, root of the word risk. And some historians believe that it's der derived from the Arabic word R-I-S-K, risk, which refers to acquisition of wealth and good fortune. And others claim that risk is, uh, uh, has its origin in the Latin word risco and is a navigational term used by sailors entering uncharted waters. So whenever you enter some place which is not known to you, you are said to enter risco. So that is where uh, many people uh, trace the origins of risk to. Uh, this is the uh, dictionary definition of risk. It says the possibility of something bad happening at some time in the future, a situation that could be dangerous or have a bad result. And this is from the Advanced uh, Learners Oxford Dictionary. And uh, we know the different usages that uh, we see on the screen. It, it could be about health risk. It could be about something about risk of a failure. It could be about risk of uh, cancer, for example, and risk of trouble, so on and so forth. So there are lots and lots of usages of risk as we see in our everyday uh, language. But in terms of sociology or in terms of uh, how we describe our society as, this goes back to uh, this book by Ulrich Beck, the German sociologist, uh, where he introduced the concept of risk, risk society towards a new modernity. So this was seen as a natural consequence of uh, late modernity right from the time that civilization started to uh, or uh, maybe from the pre-industrial era to the industrial era uh, to the uh, risk society era which uh, uh, Beck describes as uh, uh, one of the uh, things linked to uh, the stage of uh, modernization and the risks he talked was mainly environmental and it was about radioactivity about pollutants about toxins about the uh, pollution in water and food and all that so uh, this is a concept uh, and I will try and introduce the very basics of uh, risk society by Beck in our discussion today. So Beck basically talks of these three different uh, epochs in, in uh, history. The first one is the pre-industrial society, which is the traditional society, going up to the industrial society, which is the first modernity, and finally the risk society, which is the second modernity. Bex argues that uh, the uh, changes in composition of risk is uh, allied to the transformations in the society. And uh, this is, uh, uh, there are certain inherent characteristics of that. So we'll just talk about that. So basically he talks of this as a linear kind of a development from a traditional society to the industrial society and finally to the risk society. So uh, now going back to the, as I said, we'll have to, we'll just have a very sketchy detail about uh, the risk society concept as developed by Ulrich Beck. So uh, the, in the pre-industrial uh, period, whenever there were any hazards like drought or famine or plague or uh, any such thing, these were the hazards that were uh, found in the pre-industrial period. And at the level of uh, the consciousness of people, they attributed it to maybe some, uh, some god or some demons or, or, or even nature or something over which they had no control. So this is how the concept uh, or this is the concept of risk consciousness at that point of time. It was mainly about the natural hazards. 
in the uh, period of industrial modernity the natural hazards they started complemented i mean the natural hazards that i just spoke of they started getting complemented by a growing set of humanly produced uh, dangers so the their food habits their drinking habits their smoking habits and the uh, occupational hazards that they had to face in their place of work whatever so this uh, this is what uh, started to grow during the industrial era something which was not uh, seen in the pre industrial era so all these things were related to the particular epoch to the particular uh, society uh, that people were living in at that point of time so a uh, lot of injuries etc because of uh, the industrial machines and all were uh, a, a direct result of this industrialization so in this stage of development uh, they had a discrete pool of knowledge about how to regulate these risks so how to take care of these risks so somebody who was uh, or the uh, problems associated with drinking how to take care of that or the problems associated with maybe physical injuries how to take care of that so uh, this was more or less in control of human beings they knew how to take care of these risks or how to minimize those risks or even to negotiate with those risks so at this point of uh, development both the natural disasters and the man made risks were uh, more or less in the con uh, or more or less they were uh, easily uh, taken care of by the uh, human being of th that particular era uh, but in the risk society that ulrich beck uh, talks about uh, the environmental risks such as air pollution chemical warfare and biotechnology these are the things that he sp uh, speaks of uh, in my discussion today we will uh, discuss more about the other risks in the uh, present uh, uh, social structure so these uh, uh, catastrophic risks they uh, are are a direct result of the industrial or the techno scientific activities and they dominate the social and cultural uh, sphere of life and in a previous lecture i had also spoken about the surveillance economy and the uh, 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 unprecedented nature of uh, challenges that human beings are facing so in a way we can take uh, the the surveillance society to be an, a natural extension or maybe uh, supplementing and complementing the risk society itself so uh, in this kind of uh, society or, and why is this different from the early epochs is because uh, of of the social uh, pol uh, political ecological and the individual risks are such huge and are so very uh, unprecedented that uh, they are not under the control of the protective institutions of the industrial society so uh, all the institutions that were built in the industrial society the hospitals or the or the legislative structure and uh, you know these kind of things this uh, these risks are beyond the control or beyond the impact of uh, those kind of uh, defenses against uh, these disasters so just to repeat in the first stage uh, of of natural hazards there there was nothing that man could do so that is how that is why he would allude it or he would uh, attribute it to some uh, supernatural power in the risk society or in the uh, second industrial society man was generally uh, i'm just using the term humans i should be saying the human beings were uh, uh, more or less in control or they knew how to negotiate or to tackle those kind of things but in risk society these are beyond our direct control and they are uh, uh, our, these uh, protective institutions of the industrial society have little to uh, help us in the uh, the risk society uh, anthony giddens uh, uh, somebody who's uh, uh, a well known you know british uh, sociologist and who's been uh, famous for a lot of things including structuration and the third wave and so on and so forth even he has uh, spoken of uh, things like uh, external uh, risks in in the but in this present stage of modernization and this is particularly a result uh, of the innovations in science and technology according to giddens so although all such external risks were always there modern societies uh, are these days according to giddens subject to these manufactured risk such as pollution or uh, you know modernization or as i said even uh, the uh, newer impact of uh, digital infrastructure and uh, so on and so forth so uh, this is as 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 i said a new kind of an epoch uh, according to beck it has been there since the last uh, uh, three and a half decades is because of these innovations and because we have uh, we uh, have little control over these kind of things and as i will argue in today's uh, discussion that this leads to uncertainty and that is why the language of risk becomes very important when talking about 
uh, these kind of issues in in today's uh, uh, context. So uh, this is one reason why uh, many of the climate change and health issues are framed as risk in the context of uncertainty, because we are not sure about how these things could be tackled or what shape it could take or even the impact or the level of danger that it could cause to us. And I'm sure you can understand that uh, when we, we are talking in today's context, the context of the pandemic itself is so very relevant here. So that is why you know, this this uh, problem of uncertainty is uh, uh, an exam uh, is a very important problem to be tackled. And in today's discussion, I will put a lot more stress on uncertainty and you know risk itself. Uh, now again, I'll go back to uh, uh, back uh, uh, to to uh, talk again about this uh, problem of uh, you know lack of control. A lot of these uh, social insurance that we had uh, in the earlier epochs, they are missing, and that is why these are uh, this this presents uh, uh, a major problem for us. It presents a problem for the public institutions. It pre prevents. Uh, it presents a problem for for researchers, Be and it uh, you know it, it's a real problem because uh, these environmental risk could ultimately lead in the extermination of the world as we know it so uh, this is uh, contrasted with the earlier two uh, epochs this is very very unprecedented because even the uh, uh, social insurance that we had in the uh, because of the public institutions in the earlier two epochs is 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 absent there what i actually mean by is you know is is uh, kind of uh, uh, linked to the surveillance uh, economy argument that i put up earlier that uh, the uh, uh, public policy or or even uh, you know uh, having the laws against uh, these companies are very difficult because of of the unprecedented nature of of the uh, challenge that is there so in in the surveillance economics for example we are looking for, uh, at it in terms of uh, maybe monopoly or or uh, privacy but we realize that the problem is much more deeper and that is why it has to be uh, dealt with in a very different manner uh so uh, this this is uh, uh, the existing that is why the existing mechanisms of risk management is ineffective because as i said if we if you are looking at digital surveillance in terms of um, uh, privacy or monopoly then probably we are uh, not looking at the real problem and that is why these uh, this this expansion this economic scientific and technological expansion it has created these serial risks one after the other and that is why this risk management that that we had in the earlier epochs is is largely uh, ineffective so we have to look at it with a newer prism we have to see it with a different frame uh and as i said uh, beck uh, talks about uh, three icons of destruction in the book i, I showed on the on the third slide he talks mainly about nuclear power about environmental despoilation and genetic technology so many people uh, would argue that a uh, lot of the uh, health risks we uh, uh, face in, in the present times is is because of uh, uh, the dangers afforded by by this biochemical engineering or, or this uh, genetic engineering kind of thing so each of these uh, has the potential to yield a worst imaginable accident and it, it might lead to uh, extinction of human life so i don't want to sound pessimistic at all but this is what uh, uh, Beck uh, refers to as the icons of destruction in his uh, risk society uh, metaphor. So uh, from there we straightway go to risk journalism. So what I've tried to uh, give a background of of risk society, but uh, we will see that risk journalism is uh, slightly different, or uh, there are different contours to that. But it's important to understand the concept of risk society before we have a discussion on risk journalism. Uh, this is a, a very recent book by uh, Professor Ingrid Walkmer and Kasim Sharif. Uh, this is about risk journalism between transnational politics and climate change. And this is a kind of a seminal book on risk journalism. And uh, in this particular book on page uh, 17, uh, Professor Walkmer uh, describes risk journalism uh, as something which relates not only to climate change, but to all the other types of new glo globalized risks. 
it ranges from financial crisis to trans societal tax evasion to terrorism to migration and you know uh, all these kind of things which evolve on the non national global local axis so th this is no longer uh, limited to the national boundaries and it is no longer you know it it can no longer be seen in terms of global oblique local but it is uh, 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 on a continuum of the global local axis so that is uh, where we have to uh, look uh, for risk journalism at and uh, one of the important uh, 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 things to understand about uh, you know say for example climate change or or risk is about the problem of uncertainty and uh, i will uh, return to this problem again and again uh, in today's discussion this is about the problems of uh, the problem of science itself or the fact that science itself is is very uncertain whether it is medical science or climate sci science or or uh, these kind of sciences and we make the mistake of confusing school science with research science and that's very very important to understand that in school science everything is very precise everything is very perfect but science itself uh, uh, deals with uh, uh, uncertainty as, as part of its internal domain so uh, we have to understand the problem of uncertainties and in the journalistic field uncertainty presents special problems because as journalist we are uh, trained to talk about specific we are trained to talk we are asked not to use the term maybe or may or things like that in our regular context so it's important uh, to understand that uncertainty uh, is, is something that we have to understand uh, as a as a reality in the present epoch and uh, again you know this is something that uh, is is uh, has to be understood uh, before we get into the next part of the argument that there are different risk assessors so say for example if somebody is assessing risk on behalf of an insurance company then he will be putting more emphasis on the highest end of the risk that this, i mean he has to uh, keep track of the most risky part uh, so that you know uh, they they can uh, uh, put a value on, on the uh, insured object at other end people often try to underplay these risk assessments so there there is a there is a range of uh, risk when we talk about uh, you know it could be uh, climate change risk it could be about health risk it could be about financial risk it could be about the risks of of uh, digital surveillance society and then so many other risks so we are looking at we have to look at these uh, uncertainty ranges at times and often uh, people go for the most likely mid range figure so as communicators we must be aware of the possibilities or as journalists we must be aware of the possibilities of the upper end of the risk the lower end of the risk and the uh, mid range most likely uh, figure of the risk but important to understand that uncertainty does not mean ignorance uncertainty is something that we have to live or this is something which is is uh, almost synonymous with the present day risk society if i have to use beck's terminology uh so uh, it 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 moves more slowly as we we have so often seen i mean uh, it's something that you cannot put a date to and often we have seen uh, reports uh, very speculative reports about when and uh, how soon etc these uh, uh, covid 19 vaccines would emerge and we we know that uh, science uh, reporting and even medical reporting it it moves much more slowly than other beats this is no, no nothing specific so we are reporting among uncertainties and it include it might include a range of possibilities and and this this has to be understood so one of the uh, uh, important attributes of risk journalism or risk reporting is to understand the uncertainties uh, present there and the fact that many of these things might take lots and lots of time compared to many other beats so uh, and the number of possibilities that are uh, uh, present for for uh, you know such cases uh this again is a very important book by uh, it's a very important uh, publication by the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism and uh, uh, they talk about climate change in the media reporting uh, reporting risk and uncertainty so this is again uh, this was uh, published about 5 6 years back and uh, they talk about uh, things like uh, uncertainty being uh, an obstacle to decision making and of course that is where the challenge for a journalist is because at uh, some place we are also trying to uh, make the authorities act we want the executive to act in certain cases 
and if we are reporting uncertainty then probably we are giving them a, a, a long handle that you know okay if it is uncertain then we might as well wait we might as well not act we might as well not have any policy at all and that is where the challenge of the risk society and risk journalism is that often this uncertainty which is very scientific is misinterpreted as ignorance and we have to be very careful about uh, not uh, or putting it across that this uh, uncertainty is something very uh, is very natural and i will you know talk in terms of probabilities and confidence intervals as as i go on but uh, uncertainty is often the impetus for further investigation as we've seen uh, and uh, this this covid-19 pandemic has led us uh, you know to a lot of the domains which probably we might not even noticed earlier so one of these is uh, questions of health literacy so we understand uh, that uh, the uh, prepar- or the uh, preparation of vaccines or uh, the uh, you know the experiments over that it might take time it might go in very many different directions very often it might fail so on and so forth so that is one very important element of risk journalism understanding that uh, uh, uncertainty is is uh, natural uh so what we can do is to use the language of risk in instead of using the language of uncertainty we can uh, uh, take it uh, we can you know kind of negotiate it by using the language of risk so that would shift the public debate away from the idea that decisions should be delayed because uh, decisions cannot be delayed uh, until conclusive proof because very often there will not be any conclusive proof or or absolute certainty and this has been seen in the case of uh, climate change over a number of years i mean there has been proof from so many other sides so on and so forth it was there uh, i mean there are so many uh, vested interests it was there in in case of uh, tobacco for example as well where there are, there were all uh, you know um, there were there were number of research putting uh, you know going out with the view uh, at a certain point of time that tobacco is not actually that dangerous so uh, if you're looking for conclusive proof then probably uh, you are uh, Uh, creating even more risk so that language of risk is is a very important of uh, 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 component of risk journalism that absolute certainty may not always be uh, attained so this can be informed by an analysis of the comparative costs and risks of different choices of options so if you don't do anything then these are the costs and these are the risks and if you do something then these are the costs and these are the risks and if you do uh, this kind of a thing so that uh, has to be a part of the uh, uh, media discourse and as uh, journalists and as media persons it's our uh, job to train ourselves in this kind of a analysis of the comparative costs and risks involved in uh, in these cases where uh, there is no conclusive proof or where there is uh, there is time till we have a conclusive proof uh so uh one why so it, it's it's a very uh, as you say a very helpful prism uh to to uh, you know using uh, this risk uh, uh, approach or using the risk frame i will just uh, uh, in the next slide i will explain uh, you know in a moment's time again what framing is but it's important that compared to measures messages of disaster or uncertainty so we are not talking about uh, you know for example framing climate change in terms of uh, disaster or uncertainty but we can frame it as a more sophisticated and a, a more appropriate way of uh, using risk there and you know having a discussion on, on the uh, levels of risk that i spoke of and as, as we understand that there, there is a there's a range of of opinions or there is a range of uh, uh, risks involved there so we can uh, keep track of that as as we go along so that is one uh, very helpful uh, frame uh, in which to look at risk so it can uh, have have uh, you know very adverse impacts and it can be very very technical of assigning probabilities or confidence intervals so as journalists we have to as i said have this in our toolkit of uh, dealing with probabilities and confidence uh, intervals apart uh, confidence levels apart from the stories of gloom and doom that uh, are there or you know um, you know talking of either of the extremes which probably is is justified in certain cases because we have to make it uh, palatable to the average reader but uh, this is uh, something that is a, a, a new domain and that is something that uh, we must equip ourselves with so uh, just uh, the uh, famous uh, robert entman's uh, uh, definition of framing 
So framing means selecting some aspects of a perceived reality and making them more salient in such a way that it promotes a particular problem definition. So as you can understand that it's uh, something that has to be uh, inherent in the way we frame uh, these uh, crises or in the manner in which we frame these uh, events of uh, health and uh, climate change and, and uh, uh, digital surveillance and, and even terrorism and migration and all these kind of things. So uh, this is, uh, you know, using a particular uh, one particular aspect or aspects and making it more salient so that we promote a particular pro problem definition or a causal interpretation or even uh, moral evaluation and treatment. So in the book uh, that I just uh, spoke of about uh, the uh, writer's book, uh, they did a study on uh, about 350 articles from six countries and they found out these six frames. Uh, in these uh, risk stories, this was basically about climate change stories. So this is just an uh, an indicator of the risk uh, of the framing uh, uh, present in these kind of stories. So the disaster or the implicit risk frame was the most common frame, and it was there in almost 80% of the stories. Uncertainty frame because we don't know what might happen. We don't know what it might take. This kind of a thing. So that was again uh, the second most common frame in these articles on uh, climate change. Opportunity again was a very uh, common frame uh, in these stories and the explicit risk was the least present uh, in, in these kind of stories. So these are the framings that, that are uh, available for uh, uh, talking about these uh, crises. So uh, as, as, as I've just referred that journalists often are attracted to uh, uh, gloom and doom stories and that's very obvious because that's what carries the headlines, that's what uh, brings in the eyeballs, that's what brings in the clicks, and that's uh, very important that people are looking at something which is uh, extraordinary uh, and uh, something which, which has greater impact for them. But we have to be exposed to the language and the concept of risks in covering newer challenges. And one of this is to uh, uh, realize that numbers and probabilities, and uh, I keep on talking about data journalism in many of my uh, lectures, so numbers and probabilities are likely to become more important. So it's it's about uh, the potential to quantify these uncertainties and generate these probabilistic projections. It has to be enhanced. So it cannot be specific as uh, we teach, uh, we, we've been teaching our students for so long about, you know, making it as precise and as specific as possible, because in these kind of things, when we are dealing with uh, uncertainty, which is scientific and which is very real and which is very natural, and that is where these uh, uh, probabilistic projections are important. And this will be, this can be also used by policymakers in, a, in very helpful ways for making decisions. So that is one uh, uh, tool uh, kit that we must acquire. This is one skill that as journalists, uh, we must be aware of. Uh, and again, you know, in the, in the same book, uh, the uh, authors, uh, basically James Painter, he talks about uh, uh, making a journalist, you know, more familiar with numbers and probabilities. Uh, so that's basically, you know, one, one concept of data journalism again. And also using of infographics to illustrate the concept of risk so that visual storytelling or this uh, visual element again becomes very, very important. And even in regular public weather forecasting, not to talk with levels of surety or levels of certainty that we talk about. So it's important to, uh, you know, rebrand or reframe science itself in that manner that, okay, science is not about uh, some exactitude or it's not about some exact numbers, but it's basically about a probabilistic range. It is about that kind of a confidence interval. So more use of this, uh, uh, and that's a very difficult thing because, you know, we want to be uh, very, very sure about, you know, whether it's going to rain tomorrow or whether we're going to have a, a, a you know, um, a, a chillier day tomorrow. So, uh, but this is one uh, way that we have to carry forward because again, uh, as I said, uh, this is important to uh, bring in this element of, or to uh, bring in the element of uh, uncertainty that we are faced with in this risk society. Also, scientists should uh, be very, very clear to uh, where uh, as, as we put uh, in the last few all this debate about vaccines and so on and so forth has uh, been very upfront and this is one behind so 
even in the further as as we go along this risk journalism has to uh, uh, have these elements about you know where there is consensus where there is uncertainty and what are the element of risks and what are the costs involved so on and so forth so and uh, and and again to emphasize uncertainty does not usually mean ignorance when we are uncertain about certain things does not mean that uh, we don't know anything about it it means that there are risk elements but we are not aware of the uh, magnitude of those risks or there is uh, uh, there there are uh, very many opinions about the direction and the intensity of those risks even for researchers and as communicators and and as academicians this is very very important for us to understand the effect of risk language what risk which which of the risk language is effective under what circumstances with what kind of people and what metaphors are important and that's very very important as researchers and uh, this is one area where uh, a lot can be done in the indian context as well about uh, uh, the impact or the effect of risk language and you know how effective under what circumstances so there are so many possibilities of uh, using uh, the risk language and its impact and its uh, effectiveness and it, 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 its various contours and you know the different kind of associations that we can build to frame certain issues so uh, as i said this is a very very new area and this is a, a wonderful opportunity not only for budding journalists but also for uh, uh, researchers media and communication researchers to uh, provide a, a direction to you know what kind of risk languages work and in what context in with with with, with what intensity with what uh, groups and you know with uh, uh, what, what communities etc etc so uh, there there is a whole range of possibility for researchers there uh, i will uh, end with this particular uh, slide here uh, where uh, uh, professor walkmer and uh, kasim sharif uh, they say that we have we are, so uh, earlier you know risk was either you know understood in the domains of domestic or foreign reporting but we are dealing with a true globalized as uh, we said earlier true uh, global uh, uh, you know on the global local uh, axis so uh, conceptual frameworks uh, have have been realigned and you know they have reemerged so there's a lot of work happening in this field so i just lead uh, leave you with uh, this particular thought about uh, uh, research on uh, this dimension of risk journalism uh, thank you so much for your patience and with this i end my presentation on risk journalism